This episode could be triggering for sensitive listeners and contains mature content. It may not be suitable to all listeners. Should you need any emotional assistance, please see the show notes for telephone numbers that you can call. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. Any content provided by contributors such as the host, guests, bloggers, sponsors or authors are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, company, individual or anyone or anything. I just want to remind you guys of By Design Crafts. They produce the most beautiful custom-made wooden signs, puzzles, coasters, anything else you can dream up. I recently purchased a headset stand that includes a slot for my phone. It is so awesome. As I work from home, it keeps my desk less cluttered. It also has a pretty cool design. I even got one for my partner, who loves online gaming. And now he has a great place to hang his headset. I will post pictures in the Facebook group. And as always, we'll link the details in the show notes. Oh, and happy Mother's Day to all of the moms for this last Sunday. A special shout out to my mom, who is the most incredible human on the face of the earth. According to Christianity.com, quote, The Bible tells us that as the patriarch Jacob lay dying, he bestowed blessings on each of his twelve sons. These blessings also included prophecies as to the fate of each of his sons' tribe in Canaan. These tribes were known as the twelve tribes of Israel, named in honor of Jacob, whose name was also Israel. The twelve tribes individually bore the names of Jacob's sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Isaac, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. End quote. This is Decoding Cults, and I'm your host, Palsy. You are listening to The Twelve Tribes, Part 3. In today's episode, we are going to examine some more of the group's beliefs and then continue on with their history. In the last episode, we looked at how Gene started incorporating Judaism in his teachings, the looming apocalypse, and the three eternal destinies. We also spoke about how Gene said that his followers were the chosen people, but with a bit of a difference. You see, Gene stated that his followers were to bring forth the 144,000 chosen people as mentioned in the book of Revelation in the Bible. I have touched on this in previous episodes, but just as a refresher, in Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 to 8, it states, After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so that no wind should blow on the earth or the sea or against any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east with the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels, to whom God had given the power to damage the earth and the sea. The angel said, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, until we mark the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. And I was told that the number of those who were marked with God's seal on their foreheads was 144,000. They were from the twelve tribes of Israel, twelve thousand from each tribe, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Isaac, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. We know by now that many leaders of these high control groups, especially those based within the Christian faith, like to use this section of the book of Revelation to claim that they are or 
in this case, are to bring forth the chosen people with the seal of God marked on their foreheads. Gene taught his followers that they will only bear this perfect chosen people after a few generations. He used Exodus 20 verses 5, which says in part, quote, I bring punishment on those who hate me and on their descendants down to the third and fourth generation, end quote. How Jean interpreted this was that those who followed him needed to bring forth the children, but that each generation would be purer than the next until they had brought forth the 144,000 perfect young virgin males. They referred to these as the male child. When this collective of the male child were born, they would then be sent out into the world in pairs to preach the gospel to anyone who would listen before being devoured by the beast after three and a half years or 1,260 days. Jean stated that only when they had established groups across certain parts of the world, they will then be able to produce the 144,000 perfect children, and it is then when Yeshua would come back. Jean also renamed the group to the 12 tribes. He believed that he and his followers were the true descendants of the tribe of Israel and that they needed to rebuild the 12 tribes across the world. Well, not the whole world. There were areas like Africa, which he didn't deem as worthy as, say, Europe or Australia. But we'll get into that a bit later. Now, you would think that on the communes, the people could just fall in love, get married and start making babies to bring forth 144,000 perfect children. But no, you would be wrong. You, unwed men and women, aren't really allowed to interact and are definitely not allowed to be alone together. In his book, Better Than a Turkish Prison, Sinasta Kalucci relates a time where he was struggling and he was told by an elder that sex was overrated and that he needed to give up all of his so-called fleshy desires if he wanted to remain in the community. When a man is interested in a woman, he needs to bring it before the elders. The elders will enforce a waiting period and then announce to the group that a courtship is to take place between the two individuals. During this time, all of the two people's interactions are scrutinized by the group and chaperoned. After a time, I say a time because it depends on how they feel, the group will decide if the couple is compatible. Only when the group has given their permission that the couple can get betrothed can the couple hold hands for the first time and go about planning their wedding. There are some cases where people have gone through the entire waiting and courtship period and not have been allowed to get married. Some were even moved to other groups within the community to ensure that they stayed separated. Sonasta explains in his book how not being approved by the group to marry the woman that he had chosen made him feel as if he was deemed not worthy enough by the community to be given a woman. Now, I have two issues with this. Firstly, the fact that the community has a say in who you can and cannot marry. And secondly, the fact that men are given a woman, like she's a piece of property to exchange, and does not have any value as an individual, or even a human being in her own right. And don't even get me started on sexuality. You see, outwardly, they are happy to welcome a homosexual into the group, as long as they are able to, quote, kind of pray the gay away. Because, you see, same-sex couples are not allowed at all. Jean teaches his followers that love should bear fruit, meaning that the love between a man and a woman is fruitful by producing offspring. They are told that homosexuality cannot be love, as same-sex couples cannot produce children. And I just wanted to add here that Sinasta is of mixed race, and this point will be more important to remember a bit later in the story. I watched a video of a couple getting married in the tribes on YouTube. And let's just say it's a lot different from traditional wedding. Before the actual wedding ceremony, the couple partakes in a sort of a play in which they reenact what they think it'll look like when Yeshua returns. 
The bride is to be portrayed as the bride of Christ, and she is shown to give herself over into the service of God. The parents then relinquish their authority over their daughter and hand authority over to their new son-in-law. The whole spectacle includes music, dancing, and elaborate costumes. There were those times where young men and women would not want to go through the whole courtship process. You know, hormones. And they would sneak off somewhere, oftentimes to have sex. If any of these couples would get caught, they'd be forced to have what the group called a brown pants wedding. The couple will be wed immediately in whatever clothing they are wearing, usually their work clothes. Now, I say the word wed loosely, as they mostly use the ceremony to rebuke the couple. They are shamed in front of the entire community. Regardless of how they get married, once a couple is married, they are encouraged to have at least seven children. As men and women work night and day within the different sections and businesses in the community, every so often, a couple will be allowed what they called family night. On this night, the couple's children are taken care of by the single members of the community. The couple then has their meal served to them separately from the group and they get some alone time. As the anti-cult groups were circling the community and from what I can guess, they wanted to control the type of information that was taught to their children, the group decided to start homeschooling them. Each aspect of what the children are taught is decided by the council. The children did have basic subjects like maths, English, and history, etc. But it's taught with a bit of a twist. Science is called creation, and each lesson would include a phrase along the line of it was God's divine hand that brought about XXX. All of the lessons, teachings, and traditions were called the anointing, and they even had a strict curriculum on handwriting which I must say doesn't surprise me since they are told what their glass frames may be and even how they are allowed to wipe their asses. Those individuals who are tasked to teach the children are told that they need to always be in communion with the group and teach according to the Holy Spirit, as this would be passed on to the children. So not being in communion would be detrimental to the children. Even though children are homeschooled, Their lessons are often disrupted when they are needed to assist with tasks around the compound. Children are made to work, and I don't mean like chores around the house. I mean like real work in factories, bakeries, and even on the farmlands. They are made to work for many hours in harsh conditions with no compensation. I found the following on worker.gov around child labor laws in the US. Quote, Federal child labor law generally prohibits the employment of minors in non-agricultural occupations under the age of 14, restricts the hours and types of work that can be performed by minors under 16, and prohibits the employment of minors under the age of 18 in any hazardous occupation. I just want to remind you of the comment I made earlier in the episode around Africa not being deemed a suitable continent for the tribes and my earlier comment on the fact that Sinasta was of mixed race. Well, it turns out, not only was Jean anti-Semitic, but he was allegedly also very racist. In part one, I spoke about segregation in the South in America. Now, there are some sources that I found that speculate that Jean's father was affiliated with the KKK. The Ku Klux Klan, also known as the KKK, or just the Klan, originated in the USA in the 1860s. There have been three iterations of the Klan, but given the time period, I would take an educated guess that this would have been during the time of the first Klan, which was active between 1865 and 1872, and the second Klan, which was active between 1915 and 1944. The first clan was very much a white supremacist group who, quote, targeted white northern leaders, southern sympathizers, and politically active blacks, end quote. The second group was also highly white supremacist, but along with being racist towards people of color, 
they were also anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant and wanted the prohibition laws to be stricter. The second group were also the group that donned those white robes and hoods and burned crosses in people's yards. They also committed other terrible atrocities towards anyone that did not fit into their perceived perfect white world. I tried to find some hard proof for the links to the KKK, but most of the sources only speculated. So I'm only mentioning this because it may explain why Jean had the following views. In Genesis 9 verses 18 to 26 it states, The sons of Noah who went out of the boat were Shem, Ham and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three sons of Noah were the ancestors of all the people on earth. Noah, who was a farmer, was the first man to plant a vineyard. After he drank some of the wine, he became drunk, took off his clothes and lay naked in his tent. When Ham, the father of Canaan, saw that his father was naked, he went out and told his two brothers. Then Shem and Japheth took a robe, held it behind them on their shoulders. They walked backwards into the tent and covered their father, keeping their faces turned away so as not to see him naked. When Noah was sober again and learned what his younger son had done to him, he said, A curse on Canaan! He will be a slave to his brothers. Give praise to the Lord, the God of Shem. Canaan will be a slave of Shem. May God cause Japheth to increase. May his descendants live with the people of Shem. Canaan will be the slave of Japheth. After the flood, Noah lived for 350 years and died at the age of 950. They believe that after the ark landed at Mount Ararat, which many scholars believe is in modern-day Turkey, the brothers moved on to other areas of the world. Now, how Jean explained it is that they believe that the descendants of Ham eventually settled in Africa. This was gathered from Genesis 10 verse 6, quote, The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Libya, and Canaan, were the ancestors of the peoples who bear their names, end quote. Which meant that the people from Africa were meant to serve or, in their case, be slaves to the descendants of the two sons. Jacob, who was renamed Israel, was the son of Abraham, who was a descendant of Shem. So, in Jean's mind, people from Africa were indeed meant to be in service to his people, who, in naming them the twelve tribes, stated that they were the descendants of Shem. In his book, Sinaster explains how they believed that in the outside world, quote, all black people are to be servants of white people if they are to be righteous, end quote. <sighs> it makes me sick. In the group, they refer to this as the sham teaching. They also believe that people of Asian heritage were the descendants of Yapoth. The group used to be openly racist and would at points not serve people of color in their restaurants. I did find reports that outwardly their stance has changed in recent years, especially following the Black Lives Matter movement. But insiders have said that even though they are on a drive to recruit more people of color, they are still only assigning them to the most menial tasks and they can also not climb up the ranks of leadership. In his book, Sinaster tells of how they are taught that the Holy Spirit had not walked the earth for 1,900 years until Yoni came, but that the 12 tribes had actually been born around the time that dated back to the slave trade, and in my mind also segregation. Sinaster also notes how the more radical teachings, like the racist ones, are not really taught to any newcomers, but rather to those who had been with the group for a substantial amount of time and are pretty much indoctrinated with most of the teachings. Another thing I picked up is that there are no interracial couples in the group, which is very similar to KSB. I'm just going to insert a trigger warning here around abuse and also, in my mind, medical abuse. If you may find this triggering, please skip over the next minute or so. 
Another one of Jean's rules, which started around the time when the group moved from Chattanooga and became more closed off, was that all illness came from sin and could only be treated through prayer, confession and on occasion herbs. People who did become sick were seen as lacking faith. Any medical care outside of the group was very much discouraged and in many cases forbidden. An ex-member did state in an interview that one of the reasons that this rule came into play was to hide the signs of child abuse. In the US, if a doctor suspects any form of child abuse, they must immediately report it to the authorities. And, as we know from the previous episode, they may well have been abusing children, even beating them black and blue. Women are to give birth at home, and unfortunately, because of the lack of proper medical care, there have been many reports of stillborn children and the death of young children. They are also taught that the pain of childbirth is actually beneficial to women. All of the followers are told that they have to take cold showers because it apparently increases their white blood cells, which will prevent illness and increases longevity. Furthermore, they do not have any working toilets, because according to Jean, toilets are killing America. His reasoning is that when you use a toilet, not enough feces is expelled from your body, and that causes colon cancer. The followers are encouraged to use a small wooden stool outdoors. Oh, and you must bury all of your bowel movements because, quote, our father walks around and may step in your feces, end quote. Now, I am definitely not a doctor or an oncologist, but this just didn't seem true to me. So I found this on cancercenter.com, quote, The exact cause of colorectal cancer is not known. But certain risk factors are strongly linked to the disease, including diet, tobacco smoking, and heavy alcohol use. Also, people with certain hereditary cancer syndromes or a family history of colorectal cancer have a high risk of developing the disease. End quote. They also did not give much thought to a follower's mental health. If a follower shows any indication of mental health issues, they are told that they have an evil spirit, and instead of getting professional help, they are told to pray. Jean also didn't believe in ADHD, and children who may have had this were just spanked more than others. There was one practice that I found super strange. Now you may be thinking that all of this is strange, but bear with me on this one. Remember how they believed that Asians were the descendants of Yapeth? Well, even though there are not people of Asian descent in the group to speak of, they often eat with chopsticks. In their mind, this is to impress any Asians who would happen to visit the community. Jean did not allow any form of music outside of traditional Irish and Appalachian Mountain folk music. I did see videos of meetings where members of the group would play musical instruments and other members would do what looks to me like folk dancing. I'm not going to lie, it did look very festive. Let's get back to the history of the group. So last week, we left off in 1979, when the group had sold off most of their businesses in Chattanooga and had relocated to Island Pond. But the child abuse allegations still followed them around, and they were still on the anti-cult group's radar. One of these groups, called Citizens Freedom Foundation, tried to accuse the 12 tribes of mind control, but with lack of evidence, they failed. In 1982, there were more rumours of child abuse, and it came out that three infants had died. In 1983, they made headlines again. Eddie Wiseman, Jean's 2IC, was charged with assault. Now I'm going to give another trigger warning here around violence towards a minor. So please skip over the next few seconds if this will be in any way triggering to you. It was alleged that Eddie had stripped a young girl down to her underwear and had beaten her for seven hours. Seven hours. I can't even begin to imagine how much pain that little body had to go through. Thankfully, the young girl's parents took her to a hospital 
where a nurse found 24 scars across her legs, and then the nurse obviously reported it. This incident, along with the other allegations, prompted the authorities to bring the elders of the tribe before the court to explain where and in which condition the children were living. When the elders did not comply, District Judge Joseph Wolchik signed a warrant for the police to go to the compound and look for signs of child abuse. In the mid-1980s, Jean started on his dreams of expansion by starting a compound in France. They also quickly expanded to Australia, South America, Spain, Germany and the UK. They mostly settled in rural areas with access to farmlands. And I think, and this is just my opinion, away from the prying eyes of local authorities. In the early hours of the morning on 22 June 1984, Jean and his followers were woken up when 90 state troopers and 50 social workers raided the compound. In an interview, the governor's press secretary stated that the raid was a culmination of two years of effort by the state to get parents to identify and report the abuse and neglect of their children. The authorities entered 20 homes and took 112 children into their custody. All of the children were transported to the Orleans District Courthouse in Newport, Vermont, where medical professionals were standing by to look for any signs of abuse. While the children were being transported, the local prosecutors requested that the children be detained for 72 hours so that they could complete their investigation. But they hit a little snag. The judge found that the warrant issued was too broad and that the state did not provide enough evidence to warrant the children being taken away from their parents. So all of the children were immediately returned to their parents before any checks could be performed on them. Jean immediately jumped on this and told his followers that it was God that had intervened on their behalf. He even went as far as comparing it to the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. From that day on, the 22nd of June would be a day of celebration for the tribes, kind of like a public holiday. Even though they had managed to dodge authorities at this point, Eddie's trial of alleged assault was still set. He was allocated a public defender, attorney Jean Swanko. Jean spent some time at the compound because she stated that she wanted to learn more about the group and their beliefs, and she was rumoured to have gotten a little close with her defendant. It was even said that she would at times spend the night there. She decided to build the defence on the fact that the allegations against Eddie were part of a big political agenda pitted against the community. In 1985, the assault case against Eddie was dismissed. They cited the reason for this dismissal as the lack of a speedy trial. Now, for us who do not live in the US, on law.cornell.edu it states, quote, The Sixth Amendment guarantees the rights of criminal defendants, including the right to a public trial without unnecessary delay, the right to a lawyer, the right to an impartial jury, and the right to know who your accusers are and the nature of the charges and evidence against you, end quote. And I found on findlaw.com, quote, A speedy trial basically means that the defendant is tried for the alleged crimes within a reasonable time after being arrested. Although most states have laws that set forth the time in which a trial must take place after the charges are filed, often the issue of whether or not the trial is in fact speedy enough under the Sixth Amendment comes down to the circumstances of the case itself and the reasons for the delays. In the most extreme situations, when a court determines that the delay between arrest and trial was unreasonable and prejudicial to the defendant, the court dismisses the case altogether. The US Constitution does not define exactly what speedy is when deciding whether the trial occurred soon enough. Not surprising, there has been a lot of litigation and legislation passed to help determine time limits for a speedy trial. 
The US Supreme Court provided some guidance in laying out factors to be considered when trying to determine whether the time to trial was speedy enough. These factors are length of delay, reason for delay, defendant's assertion of his right, and prejudice to the defendant. While the Supreme Court provides some guidance, the Congress and many states have passed laws to provide specific time limits for the trial to occur. The U.S. Congress passed the Speedy Trial Act, which set a time limit of 70 days from the filing date of the indictment, unless waived. Many states have also passed their own legislation as to time limits for bringing a criminal matter to trial. In California, for instance, the law dictates that a person charged with a felony shall be brought to trial within 60 days of the defendant's arraignment and within 30 days for a misdemeanor. End quote. What we need to remember is firstly, all people are seen as innocent until proven guilty. But we also need to keep in mind, as Eddie had not gone through a trial, it does not prove that he's innocent either. After the dismissal, Jean left her partner of eight years and moved to Island Pond to join the 12 tribes. In our next episode, we will continue the history of this group. I thought this would just be a three-part series, but again, like many groups, the more I looked, the more I found. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button and rate and review us. It will go a long way into improving the podcast and helping others find it. Also, please invite your family and friends to listen too. If you're listening on YouTube, please subscribe and like the video. You can also leave comments if you want to. You can find us on Facebook and you can email us at decodingcults at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. If there are any topics around the workings of cults which you would like further explanation on, or if there is a cult, like this one, that you would like to hear about, email me or post it in the Facebook group. Remember to go and check out By Design Crafts SA and Endeavor AV and tell them that I sent you. This week, I want to say if Haristo to my listeners in Greece. The amazing logo art was created by the tattoo artist Jock Jacobs. Thank you so much for listening.